In its fourth of five exhibition matches to get ready for the Paris Olympic Games, it was the one that by far was the most questionable for Team USA. As opening ceremonies in Paris are Friday evening, and LeBron James will carry the men's flag for Team USA out of all the Olympians that will represent the U.S., we get you ready for Olympic basketball here in the next half hour, live on this Monday on the early line. Brian Fonseca joins us here on this Monday on TEL to look at the fourth exhibition match against South Sudan in the near shocker, or perhaps it was just a shocker regardless of the final score. The fifth and final one against Germany today in London and all that awaits over when the Olympic Games officially begin this weekend in Paris. Brian, we appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us here on this Monday morning. Yes, thank you for having me. Love international basketball. You guys know this. Um, was all over the yep. World Cup last year and doing my best to be all over the Olympics again. And we shall see how it plays out. Because if there was any questions, if you could poke holes in the resume for the Americans at all, we saw them on display <laughs> on Saturday afternoon against South Sudan, 101-100. Team USA survives at the very end. In the final 10 seconds, it was LeBron James giving the Americans that one-point lead. But South Sudan had multiple opportunities near the buzzer, unable to convert. To call it a close call, that's one thing, Fonseca, mm. but it leads to many questions. Let's start with the exhibition match itself. How did this happen? How was it only a one-point victory against South Sudan? Got off to a slow start uh, against a team that I think is better than people realize. The Wall Dang is credited with uh, really turning this program into a legitimate program, South Sudan, which is the best in all of Africa at this point, taking the mantle from Nigeria, who beat the United States in a scrimmage before the Olympics in 2021. This is actually progress from where the United States were before the last Olympics because they had lost to Nigeria. They had lost to Australia back-to-back -back times and then finally got it together and even lost in group play, which we can get into. But, you know, South Sudan is a legit team. They're one of the worst teams in the Olympics, but that's because the Olympics only has 12 teams. This is a, a tournament that it's really hard to get into. And South Sudan qualified by being the best performing team from the African regions. So you have like Wayne Gabriel, who's been in the NBA. Nuni Omat was once a Nets G leaguer who was an exhibit 10 guy. Uh, Mario Shayok, who had a cup of coffee in the NBA at one point. Carlick Jones was a Chicago Bulls two-way. Like, there's talent on this team. And Royal Ivy is a really good coach who's an NBA assistant who was a longtime point guard who could be an NBA head coach at some point. And South Sudan, when they were in the World Cup last year, they gave my Puerto Rican some problems. Almost beat uh, Puerto Rico in the first game of the World Cup. That went to overtime. Um, and, you know, they had a good showing despite being knocked out early. So South Sudan is good. They're not, they shouldn't be doing this to Team USA. And I think it's just one of these things where people have to realize, like, this isn't the NBA. If anything, this is closer to March Madness because there's a group stage and then you have just an, a tournament from there. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a cross between, I guess, the playoffs and March Madness, but it's closer to March Madness than I think people realize. And these things happen. Brian, we're going to get to the Olympics and also obviously the tune-up today between USA and Germany. But give me a synopsis here of this exhibitions that we're seeing from Team USA. What have you gotten out of it? Do we Are we settling on a starting lineup? Are you impressed more with a certain player than the other ones? Or maybe you see a player that should be playing more that's not getting enough playing time at this point right now with Team USA. Bam Adebayo should be starting over Joel Embiid. I don't think Joel Embiid uh, won. Like, his placement on this team doesn't make a ton of sense just from the standpoint of like, you got French citizenship to play for France, and then you turn around and play for Team USA, and now people in France are going to probably boo you when you show up in the Olympics, um, given the the scathing things that have come out since then. And that that's a whole ordeal that you should Google. Like, it's very, it's not not a pretty sight, uh, considering how long it takes for people to get French citizenship. And Joel Embiid was able to just get it because he's an amazing basketball player and then turn around and started to play for Team USA anyway, despite originally being from Cameroon regardless. Um, so you have that and then the element of him starting on this team where, I mean, this is a team that's going to be amazing. It's great. It's one of the best collections of basketball players that we've seen on Team USA in terms of resume, even though some guys are a little bit older. But 
why is he in the starting lineup when really he should probably be coming off the bench and you should monitor his minutes. And the reason why I think Bam should be there is because of what we saw in the last Olympics where he's the guy who's going to hold it down defensively that you can throw on. He's honestly, you know, probably the best defensive player on this team. Uh, and that includes Anthony Davis. And w- the minutes that him and Anthony Davis play together actually look really well. But Bam just makes more sense, especially if you want to go offense heavy. Like the starting lineup that we saw against South Sudan was a uh, Drew Holiday, Stephen Curry, Devin Booker, LeBron James, and Joel Embiid. And I just don't think that that's really your best starting five that you could put out there that makes the most sense. Um, I would like to see Bam take the spot of Joel Embiid and Joel Embiid come off the bench and just wreak havoc on second units, perhaps along with Anthony Edwards. And I get why Drew Holiday is starting in that game against South Sudan, but I'm not sure he needs to be starting either. So, so Fonseca, you mentioned it. In the tune-ups to the 2020 Olympic Games, of course, played during the 2021 summer over there in Tokyo. We lost to Australia in the tune-ups. We lost to Nigeria. So based on what you have seen in the four exhibition matches so far for the Americans, are you truly concerned Are there any grave issues that would keep Team USA from winning a gold medal in Paris? Um, I don't put, I try not to put too much into the scrimmages because, you know, they're different. You're tinkering with things. You're playing even deeper rotations than you will in the uh, actual Olympic Games, which, you know, the rotations are going to be deep because it's international basketball. There's fewer timeouts. It's a different flow, things of that nature. Um, When you watch, like, European basketball, a lot of the top minutes guys on other teams play like 25-ish minutes a game, 26 minutes a game. Part of that is because the games are 40 minutes like we're going to see in the Olympics now. But part of that is also because there are fewer timeouts and the rotations could go 10, 11 deep, uh, maybe even longer than that, depending on the coach. So the concern is 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 there just because like, should they be minus 430 against the field or whatever the price is right now? Maybe. But yeah. am I looking at, hey, Europe as a continent to win the Olympics at plus four, 500 as an interesting bet. Yeah, because one, they have five teams in the Olympics out of the 12. But two, you're getting like France, who is the host, who adds Victor Wembanyama, Bilal Koulibaly. You're getting Germany, who won the World Cup. You're getting, you know, Spain, who has a great resume. You're getting Greece, who has Giannis. And obviously, you're getting Serbia, who is going to be in Team USA's group. Team USA's group, luckily for them, is not very strong. Like, again, I love the Puerto Rican national team, but Team USA should beat them down. Uh, South Sudan is in there. I feel like they kind of had their shot. And, you know, they're a team that has high highs and low lows. So Team USA might smack them in the rematch. We'll see. And then Team USA versus Serbia is really the question there. But even if they lose the game, which they did against France in group play last time, they could still move on into the quarterfinals, have a decent matchup, and win. So losing one of the games would be the end of the world. You would just ideally want it to be Serbia, if anybody, but they had an easy time handling Serbia the first time, so I think they'd be fine in that matchup. So Fonseca, only one minute left in this segment. We'll get to plenty more around Olympic basketball in just a moment. But today in London, 3 p.m. Eastern time, the fifth and final exhibition game for Team USA ahead of the Paris Olympics against Germany. Here are the numbers. We'll look at them now. We'll get the breakdown from Fonseca on the other side of the break. It is a 14 and a half point spread now live and updated on the FanDuel Sportsbook and over under at 189 and a hook. Fonseca, look at the numbers. Donnie Wright's side, mm. look at the numbers. Yep. We'll talk about the final yep. exhibition match and then the path for Team USA at the Paris Olympics to win a gold medal. That will be our conversation up next here on the early line on the Sports Grid Network. Are we concerned? Is it just a tune-up for a reason? More to come on PEL Next. One last exhibition match before the real thing starts this weekend in Paris for Team USA. The Americans take on Germany today as a 14 and a half point favorite in London with a total of 189 and a hook. Brian Fonseca back for a second consecutive segment. We showed you the odds for the fifth and final exhibition match in Team USA's tune-up for the Summer Olympic Games. Again, updated number. Now 14 and a half in favor of Team USA. Fonseca, it was a scare against South Sudan. What do you want to see from Team USA in its final exhibition match before the Paris Olympics? 
Yeah, you get the sense that they're going to treat this more like the actual dress rehearsal as opposed to, hey, this is the last preseason game. Let's just rest everyone and play like, you know, Nigel Hayes, for example. Uh, I don't I don't think they're going to go that route. Um, and Germany, you know, they're the defending world champions. They won the World Cup in 2023. So I think Team USA is going to particularly want to showcase themselves in this one, which has me looking at that minus 15 and a half and thinking about it. But you know, it's it's also it's scrimmage, so you don't quite know. Uh, what I want to see is um, again, like them have a a set rotation and see what that looks like. What are they going to commit to before the games actually start? Because after Germany, they're starting with Serbia, so you're immediately going into Nikola Jokic and a team that finished second in the World Cup last time in 2023 that lost to Germany, but again did not have Nikola Jokic. Also, did not have uh, Sili Micic who is now on the Serbian national team as well. So I think with Germany, um, you know, it's an interesting game because they have a bunch of players coming back from that World Cup championship team. Dennis Schroeder in particular, Franz and Mo Wagner, Daniel Tice. So this is a good team. And Team USA, you know, has to basically treat this like this is the real deal now. Um, Not that they weren't before, but now the Olympics are basically starting at this point. Brian, if we take a look at the Olympics as a whole and start to focus on Team USA, you take a look at LeBron James, who is going to carry the flag for the United States during the opening ceremony. The reason I'm asking you this, is he the alpha dog on this team? When we look late in the basketball game, is he the go-to guy, in your opinion, should be the go-to guy here? I think he is because he's the executive producer on the documentary. They're inevitably going to air after this ends. <laughs> like he, he's, he's absolutely like he's the alpha here. Um, he's the one that I think is at least in part responsible for putting this together. Right. Um, he, I think he's the reason it, it, it seems that way from reporting that, you know, they got Anthony Davis, they got Stephen Curry, um, Kevin Durant is back. Like, These are guys that typically at this stage of their career don't really need to be doing this. And LeBron James coming back into the Olympics now at the stage of his career that he's in is pretty shocking. I think he's the alpha in terms of that. He's unquestionably the leader, the captain. I think the fact that he's going to be the flag bearer is actually really, really cool. Um, And something that people should know, a men's basketball player hasn't had this honor for Team USA ever. So like, you know, and this was, I think, voted on by fellow Olympians as well. So that's also uh, pretty awesome. Um, but in, in late game situations, I feel like offensively, they may play through him. I think Kevin Durant may put up the most shots though. I get the sense like from an offensive standpoint and, and, you know, that's probably how you would want to devise it anyway, because Kevin Durant, you know, is one of the best scorers ever. And in Olympic play, he's basically the best scorer that team USA has ever had. So, Fonseca, when you look at the odds perspective, because you shared it a few times, we've talked about it during the break, Team USA is still a hefty favorite to win a gold medal despite moving back in the market ever so slightly after the poor performance against South Sudan on Saturday. Minus 430, updated numbers as of this Monday morning, minus 400. Canada, second best price at 10 to 1. France and Serbia tied for the third best number now, again, updated on FanDuel at 15 to 1. Who is the best test? The Team USA will see either in group play or during the medal round at the Paris Olympics. It's Serbia first because that's we know they're going to see Serbia. And then from there, we have to sort of see what happens in the group of death, which is group A, which is Canada, Greece, Australia, and Spain. And I think three of those teams could advance into the next round. It's entirely possible, I would say even likely, given the structure of the other two groups, that three teams do advance. So to me, we'll have to see what happens there. Canada's getting a lot of love because they're top-end NBA talent, and they have of, you know, I mean, Shea Gildas, Alexander, Jamal Murray, just to name a couple of guys, but their team is absolutely loaded. They just won a bronze medal at the World Cup with a bunch of these same guys in 2023. They're going to get a lot of hype. I think they're going to have a a more difficult time in group play than people realize because Australia is really good. They're experienced and they got a bronze medal in the last Olympics. And a lot of that core is coming back and it was their first bronze medal in the Olympics. So that's something that they're going to be playing off of in terms of momentum and things of that nature. And then you have, like, just elsewhere. I mean, France just bombed in the World Cup. Like, I thought that they were good enough to win the whole thing, and they were the first team eliminated, basically, because Canada smacked them down, and then they lost again to, like, Latvia. Um, France is 
adding Victor Wembanyama <laughs> and Bilal Koulibaly to their roster. Like this is a dangerous, dangerous team. So we'll we'll have to see where Team USA stands afterwards. Whether they're going to run into a Canada, whether they're going to run into France, whether they're going to run into potentially Germany. Um, you know, if they're going to see Greece and Giannis at any point, Australia. There's a lot out there, but. For yeah. now, it's Serbia because we know they're going to play Serbia. That's the first game in the Olympics, and that's one that, while they're favored by double digits, I mean, Serbia is really good, and they have the basketball pedigree. These are two programs that faced each other in the Olympics before in a gold medal game in 2016, where I think Nikola Jokic was coming off the bench. So that's that's the first test. Team USA, a hefty favorite to win Group C at minus 1,200. But you mentioned the Olympic opener against the Serbians. It's a 16.5-point spread for the Americans against Nikola Jokic and his national team. Quickly here, Fonseca, 40 seconds mm-hmm. left in this segment. How will you approach the large spreads that Team USA will see pretty much in every game at the Summer Olympics? I think... Going back to the Serbia game, it probably starts with how they perform in that one. Um, and I also need to see, like, Puerto Rico is going to play South Sudan. We're going to get informed as to what the spread is going to be afterwards because then Team USA is going to have Puerto Rico and South Sudan. So it's going to be difficult to, like, cover those really, really big numbers because, you know, things happen late in games or whatever the case may be. But Team USA has had some big blowout wins before, so I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again. We shall see some summer league talk with the rookies up next on the early line. Tonight in Las Vegas, Sin City, the site of the NBA 2K25 Summer League Championship game between the two unbeaten teams left standing, the Memphis Grizzlies and the Miami Heat. The Grizz, a two and a half point favorite, the over under 187 and a hook. But outside of who wins a title as a team in the summer, it's a time, Brian Fonseca, to look at how we expect the rookies to perform at this next level. Zach Eady should be in the game tonight for Memphis. He is the Rookie of the Year favorite entering the 2024-25 NBA campaign at a 6-1 to number. Reed Shepard of the Houston Rockets has had a great summer in Las Vegas, 7-1 to the price. Zachary Rizache, of course, the number one overall pick to the Hawks, the third best number at 8-1. to Then the group you see there with 10-1 to numbers. From what you have seen in Summer League and what you anticipate in regular basketball, Come October, how do you evaluate those Rookie of the Year odds in the association? Because this rookie class wasn't an exceptionally awesome one, it's difficult to project who's going to walk into just big minutes right away if it's going to be anybody in particular. Zach Eady, you see the sort of pathway for him to play at least regular minutes. Is it going to be enough for him to actually become the Rookie of the Year, which he's favored to be, which is kind of wild to me considering where the polarization of Zach Eady was uh, leading into the draft. Um, Reed Shepard is really good, it looks like, but the pathway to minutes there in Houston, like that's a crowded team. That's a crowded team that wants to win also. Like they actually have ambitions of making the playoffs, getting playoff revenue. They have Alperin Shingun who has a contract decision looming. They have Jalen Green who has a contract decision looming, things that they're going to have to figure out after the season. Um, And you also have like Jabari Smith, where is he going to be in his development? Fred Van Vliet's still there. Dylan Brooks is still there. We'll see what happens with the rest. But like, it's going to be hard for Reed Shepard to walk into like big minutes right away. We assume he'll be in the rotation and get regular minutes. But what kind of rookie of the year is this going to be? Is this going to be a year where somebody walks in and looks like a potential all-star? Or is it going to be kind of like 2016-17 where Malcolm Brogdon won rookie of the year because he was the best of a group? That didn't seem particularly great. Taking a look here at the 2025 NBA championship odds here, the Celtics and to the victors go the spoils. That is true. Everybody seems like they're getting paid on the Celtics. They're a three to one price to win it. The Thunder, the Nuggets, and then the Sixers and the Knicks, maybe the biggest movers here in the offseason. How are we shaping up 2025 in the championship race for you, Brian? Yeah, this is another market where it's like, and and long shots don't historically like win it, but there's another one where I'm just looking at like, man, I I would just want long shots at this point because I don't feel the need to bet the Celtics at plus 300. It's a price I can get for sure later on. And especially if they start off and it's a little bit dicey because Chris Asports is going to be out for at least the first couple months, maybe even deeper than that into the NBA season. So that, that there's no reason for me to take the Celtics at that point. 
And it's also very hard to repeat as champions. So there's that element of it as too. Uh, Jason Tatum uh, is in the Olympics. What happens there? Drew Holiday is in the Olympics. What happens there, et cetera. Um, you know, Memphis is a team like as a long shot, maybe they're worth a sprinkle. They're in the thousands. They're going to try to be on a redemption tour. Their roster quietly performed like the depth guys performed pretty well in the absence of damn near everybody last year. And they're getting back damn near yeah. everybody this year. And also adding Zach Eady. Like I, I like Memphis as a long shot. I don't actually think they're going to be holding up the trophy at the end of the year, but the organization is ambitious. And when you're taking these long shot futures, you have to bet on, Hey, who might make a move between now and February to sort of increase their chances. John Morant, Jaron Jackson, Jr. Desmond Bain, but also they have bench players that they develop like uh, Gigi Jackson, Jr. And Vince Williams, Jr or who you could sort of shape the rest of your play, uh, playoff rotation around. 40 to 1, the price on the Memphis Grizzlies, tied with Orlando for the 11th best number entering next year to win the Larry O'Brien Trophy in the NBA. Of course, last year was highlighted first by the 25-game suspension for John Moran at the start of a season ago, then the injury not long after his return, and then everybody got injured in the grind city. But the Grizzlies were... The number two seed in the Western Conference playoffs each of the prior two seasons in the NBA. A good look very early on from Brian Fonseca, who has been here for three consecutive segments. So we thank him now for his time. Fonseca, we appreciate the time. I'm sure we'll talk during Olympic basketball as well. Absolutely. Anytime.